Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of presenting special guest Gordon Firemark to the show. Gordon is known as the podcast lawyer and has practiced media and entertainment law in solo practice since 1992. Gordon is the producer and host of the Entertainment Law Update podcast since 2009 and author of the podcast, blog, and new media producer's legal survival guide. His undergraduate degree in radio, television, and film and experience in live theater production informs his thinking about all things legal. In addition to running a busy law practice, Gordon teaches entertainment law at Columbia College Hollywood, intellectual property and media law at Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, and contract law at Pepperdine Law School. You can see Gordon live each Thursday, Pacific time, on The Podcast Lawyer, which is live on Facebook. It's a great pleasure. I welcome Gordon to the show. Welcome to the show, Gordon. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be with you. After that introduction, I don't know if we have any time left for the interview, but... uh... (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for coming on. And I have to say, being a lawyer myself and having you known as The Podcast Lawyer, you piqued my interest. And I wanted to ask you, how did you get into podcasting in 2009? And where did you find it was your desire, I guess, your, your niche? How did you get into this area? Like, what? Well, okay, if you don't mind, I'll go back to the very beginning. My, my first exposure to live theater came, came when I was in kindergarten. I was about five years old. We were living in, in uh, Brookline outside Boston, Massachusetts. And our school... It was a K through 12 school. The high school kids were doing a production of Oliver and they brought the kindergartners in to be an audience for a dress rehearsal. And that curtain went up and the lights came on and I was just mesmerized, hooked, drawn in. And that became my thing. Mom, dad, you got to take me to see plays. I want to see, you know, I want to see shows and that kind of stuff. They were theater goers, so they were happy to do it. Cut to a few years later, we've moved across the country. My dad had a new job and I was starting to get into some low grade trouble with my friends at school and, and in the Cub Scouts and things like that. Uh, and somehow the principal, Mr. Evans at the, at the junior high I was in decided that he needed me to run the lights and sound for the school variety show and play and stuff like that. And so that again, back to theater brought me back in. And I did that all through high school, began working professionally in theater as a, as a junior in high school and uh, off to college, I go, I, I major in radio TV. And well, I started as a, as a theater major at the university of Oregon, but it was a, performance oriented program. I was always behind the scenes guy running the mics and the lights and things like that. So I switched over to radio, TV, and film. I got to play with cameras then too. Right. And, uh, and finished college with a degree in radio, TV, and film. It was only in my senior year that I had a professor suggest, Hey, I was doing well in the, in the, you know, 500 and 600 level classes that dealt with government regulation of the media, things like that. So she said, Hey, you've got an aptitude. You should think about going to law school. And when I finished laughing, (laughs) I sort of said, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. I took the LSAT. I did better on the LSAT than I did on the, uh, the gender, the graduate record exam. And I got into law school, but I didn't get into film school. So I actually came back to LA and decided not to go to law school right away. Started working in the television and film business just before the writers guild went on strike and that was then, so I'm a year out of college now, and that was sort of my impetus to, to think about it and go back and do the law school thing. So it was always entertainment first, law second. And after finishing law school, getting out in the cold, cruel world of, of lawyering, sure. uh, this is, it is the early 90s. So you remember in the late 80s and 90s, there was a TV show called uh, LA Law, yes. made law look like really sexy and, and fun oh, stuff. Yeah. 
<laughs> total fabrication. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a glut of law students and in the middle of a, a moment when all the big law firms were consolidating, all the movie studios were consolidating, jobs were scarce. So I ended up going out on my own as a lawyer and having to learn how to market a law practice and how to promote and all that. I started writing a newsletter and then that evolved into a, a blog as soon as blogging became a thing and I discovered podcasting when a TV show guy that I followed, a guy named Leo Laporte started a podcast and I thought, oh, that's cool. I could probably get into that. And a couple of years later, someone invited me to be a guest on a show and that led one thing to another. I started my own show in 2009 and and at the time I was recognizing, you know, I wanted to look up what's the law around this stuff and doing entertainment law already. I kind of had a sense of it, but I decided to look for, you know, where are the differences and gaps and things. There were no resources out there. So I wrote a book, researched it and wrote the book. And that sort of positions me now as the guy in the podcasting space. And so I've taken on the brand, the podcast. I love lawyer. it. I love it. The podcast lawyer and having it you know, trademark for yourself. I think you fit it perfectly. I think you have exactly the skill set that is necessary to have this area under your belt. And I think it's great to have you, to have that knowledge base under you that you can help people with the general public and anyone aspiring as a podcaster or anyone who has their own show already. That's actually an object lesson for people who are whatever business you're in, whatever market you're in, whatever it is you do, as you become expert, as you, as you build up your authority, I think it's uh, obviously, I think it's perfectly okay to own that and give yourself the brand, give yourself permission to, you know, be the, the king of mattresses or whatever it is you do yes. and uh, really use that to the greatest value you can. What do you think in terms of the, the advent, the pandemic, I think there's been 2.6 million podcasts globally that have just surged. Yeah. You think in 2009, when you started out doing your show, that you would see that many podcasts follow suit over the, you know, the next decade or so? You know, I don't, I don't know that I saw it as growing to quite those big numbers. And, and actually, there's some debate about what those numbers mean, because there's an awful lot of those 2.9 million or 2.6 million, whatever, where they have one, two, three episodes, and then they never hear from them again. But there is a large core group of people who are putting out you know, active podcasts every week, every month, there's a new episode. I, I did sort of get, had a sense that this is a new way of doing it. it you know, the, the playing field is suddenly level. It was like blogging, but you can do radio production or video production. And that's exciting to me. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to pat myself on the back for being a visionary, but for me, it was just something I was going to do because it was fun. And I liked the idea of it actually started out to monetize podcasting by offering continuing legal education credit to our audience. Uh, our show is a legal roundup. It's called Entertainment Law Update. It's a legal roundup of entertainment law news. That didn't work out so well. Listeners didn't jump on the bandwagon and want to pay us for credit certificates, but we've kept doing it. And it's great for positioning, again, positioning us as experts, my co-host and I. And whenever anybody says, well, you know, where, where can I find out more about you? I said, well, you can listen to my podcast, <laughs> you know, exactly. Exactly. If you ever get bored, here's, here's my show, but you can, you can learn and, and gain a lot of insight and wisdom and opportunity. I, I, I love telling people that if you want to, if you want to check out something, check out my show. Like for and you, it's a great tool for marketing. I mean, you know, a positioning, exactly. somebody comes looking for a lawyer that does what I do. They find my website. They see, Oh, he's got a podcast. They hear me talking. They hear the smile in my voice. They, they know that I get around with my co-host. And so I'm a, I'm a human being, not just some stodgy <laughs> old guy in a suit in an office somewhere. You know, it's that builds up that no like, and trust factor that is so important. No matter what it is you do, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. So. What do you think it takes to create a successful podcast? And in, in now, that we're, you know, where we are right now compared to say, when you started out, when I started out, you had to kind of understand how to car, how to write an RSS feed in XML language and stuff like that. I, I got a book and I was like following along line by line. <laughs> Nowadays, you don't have to do that. There's all kinds of easy tools and, and services out there that make this super easy. I think you have to have a message. You have to have something to say and a desire to have an impact on people. I am not a huge believer that giant numbers is the only goal for podcasting. It's, it's certainly a, a laudable goal, reach as many people as you can, but even if you only had 20 or 30 listeners and you did a show every week, if you compare that to say you went down and rented the room, a public room at the local library, 
if you had 30 people showing up every week to hear you talk from exactly. a stage, that'd be a serious accomplishment. So <laughs> you're having an impact on people's lives. And if you've got something important and valuable to say, this is a great way to get out there and say it. And don't worry so much about the numbers. Don't worry so much about performance. Worry about crafting a good message, getting it out there and uh, helping people. I know from my vantage point, people I interact with, they know I'm a podcaster for my show, which I, I, that's like my third role. It's more of an attorney and then psychic and then podcaster, but podcasting mm -hmm. has become a passion for me. What do you think are the most important tips that you'd recommend to our audience? If they're a creator or a podcaster, like how would you recommend they go about it, protecting themselves and making sure that they're in the right place so that they can maximize their opportunity for success? Well, you know, first off, I'd say don't obsess about protecting yourself. It, it make it, you know, make smart decisions. Of course, don't go, you know, copying other people's stuff. Don't go using music that you don't have the rights to and permissions for. I'm on a bit of a crusade saying if, if you're interviewing guests on a podcast, you should have a, a signed release from the guest that gives you consent to record them, consent to use that recording in perpetuity, irrevocably, and that you're not going to have to pay anybody if they, you know, if you use it in some other medium, all those kinds of things. And I offer a free guest release to podcasters. Just give me your email address, go over to, to uh, podcastrelease.com and download that release and use it every time. Like I refer to it as practicing safe guest and, uh, <laughs> you know, use it every time. <laughs> safe guest. I like that. Yeah. And I'd say that's one of the biggest things, obviously, you know, respect other people's copyrights and trademarks and those kinds of things. But ultimately that's number one. And if you have co-hosts, if you have partners in the thing and so on, you got to get that relationship figured out and documented somehow in writing. Maybe it's because you, you know, you form an LLC together or a corporation and that hand, you know, the bylaws and the shares and things handle that. Or maybe you just have an agreement, a co-host agreement, or maybe it's more of an employment agreement if you're just bringing on a host to help you with stuff. Same thing is true for writers and editors and researchers and, and everybody else. I call these the podcast prenup. You've got to know what's going to happen if things don't go well. Earlier today, I was talking to a, a prospective client who is breaking up with her podcast co-host. It's like a divorce. And, and the question is, well, who owns it? Who owns the feed? Who owns the audience? How, you know, can, who gets to use the title of the show? All of that stuff that they've created together over the past few years is the house and the kids. Wow. And, you know, they're, they're going through a divorce essentially. So having a prenup makes that a lot easier. It's not easy, but it's certainly easier if you've already talked it out at the beginning to figure out who gets what, or how do we work it out? Who buys out whom and what, under what conditions? So you know, this is basic business stuff. Everybody in, in, in you know, any business should have these kinds of things worked out, but most podcasters, people don't things at all too. Most yeah. people don't think they just think, Hey, I got a webcam, some lights, and I'm going to just start going. I'm passionate. I want to talk about turtles. I'm going to have my podcast on turtles. <laughs> I'm making a joke, but yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. They don't think about if they had the local person from the zoo talking about turtles, that they should get them to sign a form and, and have the right paperwork in place. And even maybe to ask the question is, is it okay with your bosses that you're doing this? <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Cause then you have a larger entity and then that's a whole other issues is, is trying to get that lined up as well. well. And you know, one of the most common reasons that somebody will say, Hey, can you take that episode down is my boss didn't like it that I did that without talking to him first. So it's not that they said anything they shouldn't have, or they, or they regret doing the episode. It's that they didn't get them, you know, they weren't authorized to do it if they're speaking as a, as a representative of the organization they're with, you know, if somebody's just speaking as an individual, that's no big deal. But a lot of times people's, they only find out it's a problem when their boss finds out they did the show and is like, wait a minute, wait, I didn't say you should, you know, that kind of thing. And there are people in certain professions that really shouldn't be offering advice on podcasts or publicly, you know, stockbrokers, for example, they've got to be really careful about the kind of stuff that they get into. So it makes sense to have those conversations early. Absolutely. What have you found to be the biggest hurdle that your clients make when they try to start doing podcasting or any type of creative digital content? And you say that if you could have had the opportunity to explain to prevent them from making that mistake, what would be that kind of mistake that you see that people make time and time again? The biggest legal hurdle is, is not understanding copyright and, 
and the idea that that music that you hear every day on the radio or on Spotify, that if you want to put it in your show, you've got to pay someone for that right. The, the, the running joke among those of us in the, in the podcasting music legal community, it's always ACDC back in black. Everybody wants that song <laughs> as the intro for their show. Bum, that's all I'm going to sing. <laughs> that one the, but, and that's the thing of also just singing it is actually an infringement of the copyright that the songwriters own. So it's not just about the recording by ACDC, but it's also about the composition of the music by, I guess it was the members of ACDC that wrote that. But so there's two copyrights. It's a complicated stuff. And folks often adopt a theme song or a piece of music or they, or they don't read the license, even if they do buy royalty free music to use it. And they don't realize that they have to pay for it every episode or something crazy like that. So just, I guess the big hurdle is being well-informed about the rules People think, oh, this is just a fun hobby, but there's a rule. This is media production. You know, and from my vantage point, you're the first podcast lawyer I've had on my show. So <laughs> well, there's only a few of us out there. <laughs> so. well, I mean, you're the podcast lawyer. So I feel like I'd like to ask you about some of these rules. Yeah. In reference to copyright, if mm-hmm. you could explain most of my audience, I mean, I'm an attorney. I have an understanding yeah. of general copyright stuff from when I had a study for, you know, the bar or school or whatever, intellectual property. But sure. I want to ask if you could just... Walk us through those steps so that the audience can kind of have some instruction on this stuff. Well, copyright is one of the three main forms of what we call intellectual property. And just to cover the other two, patents protects inventions that are unique and non-obvious and those kinds of things. Trademarks are brands, names for products and services, marks that are used, logos, designs to identify the source of particular goods or services in interstate commerce. And so actually your podcast title can be a trademark. Yes. In, in fact, it should be a trademark. Yeah, now, copyright, copyright protects original works of authorship, the expression of ideas as embodied in anything. It could be a book, a poem, a, a song, a recording, a film, a sculpture, an architectural design. All of that is somebody's ideas that have been turned into an expression it's been recorded or fixed in some tangible form. So that's all you have to do to get a copyright is have an original idea and or original form of expressing an idea and fix it, document it, record it, write it down. So just the mere act of pressing the record button when we started this podcast episode makes you the author of the copyright, makes us the authors of the copyright in this episode. And I've already said, you're the author, it's yours. So So owning the copyright is easy. There is a registration system here in the United States. You can and often should register your copyrights, but it's not required in order to have the protection. If somebody comes along and uses your copyrighted property, that being making copies, distributing copies, making derivative things based on the original, performing the work in public or or displaying it, depending on which kind of work it is, Those are the things that only the copyright owner is allowed to do and or allow others to do. So using that stuff without permission is infringement of copyright and it has consequences. And it can be very expensive. (laughs) It can. Yeah. I mean, not always, but usually it is. And fighting lawsuits is always expensive. So I, I appreciate that overview because I know a lot of people ask me all the time, like, what do I need to do if I have my own show? And I'll say, I always tell them consult with an attorney and make sure their rights are protected. That's my legal yeah. in, in layperson terms, because oh, hey, follow I'm, me on social media. I talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, now I know I can say contact Gordon, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> reach out to Gordon. I had him on the show episode blank, whatever episode it is, I could direct them to the, to the link where we're explaining and discussing this when it deals with fair use. Can you explain what fair use is as a term in this, in this field? So our yeah, well, so I, I just finished explaining about, about copyright, which is a law that restricts what you can do, what you can do in terms of the way you speak, speak and express your own stuff. Well, here in the United States, we have the first amendment, which among other things protects the right of free speech and free press. So we have an inherent conflict between copyright law saying you can't copy that thing in order to make your own expression and the first amendment that says, well, you have free speech. So in order to address that conflict, when it has come up, the courts and now the Congress have made it a part of the statute, this defense to infringement claims called fair use. It's a complicated analysis. You have to go through four different factors, none of which is determinative. And every case is different. 
But the bottom line is you're looking at not just how much you've taken qualitative, quantitatively, but also qualitatively. What's the amount and substantiality of the portion that's been copied? You look at the nature of the original work, you look at the purpose and character of the new work, the infringing work, and the impact on the market for the original. And you ask the question of, you know, does this somehow transform the work in terms of purpose, in terms of uh, intended audience and the way it's perceived and so on? So that's how, you know, movie critic shows can talk about the movie and then play a little clip because that's transformative. It's critical commentary, educational, those kinds of uses that we want as a society, we value and we've decided to, to protect the speech on that side of it. The more commercial or more just plain art, expressive kind of stuff, maybe it's less so. And again, the more you take, the less likely it is to be a fair use. And so it's this, it's this four factor balancing sliding scale kind of a test. And then look at it in, in terms of, of how often was it used? How, how was it appropriated or, or what was the, the, the use behind it? And if it was used for educational, if you're doing like mm-hmm. a, a review of something yeah. or if you're a critic, then you have the educational aspects. You can fall under the fair use as an exception. Yeah. I mean, this is where a lot of the misconceptions come up. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I'm not making any money from it. That's not actually one of the factors. Or, well, it's educational use. Yeah, but you took the whole thing and you played it three times and, you know, it, it's more than just the educational. It's the other ones that, that come up. Well, I only took a, a tiny little portion. Like, that doesn't necessarily mean it's fair use either. You have to do this whole complicated analysis on each case. Each, each clip in a, in a film or in a podcast has to be analyzed according to this. And it's just uh, on my podcast this morning, we were recording, we talked about a case where the same footage, it was footage of the 9-11, the, the tower collapsing, shot by this guy from the street in New York. He licensed it to someone and they then sub-licensed it to a whole bunch of other people without his permission. And he's suing all these films. Some of the films it was fair use, some of them it wasn't. Same exact clip being used in different ways by different people. So, wow. yeah. You know, that's a lot of, we don't think of those things as a general public. I mean, as an attorney, I may think of that as an academic situation where we're talking to each other today mm-hmm. and I can understand what you're talking about, but the average person on the street yeah. in the digital age that we're living in right now, I doubt they would think of those type of situations. So it's good to be at least aware. And that plays both ways. You know, the average person on the street nowadays is carrying one of these, you know, a cell phone with a camera in it. Any one of us can make that next piece of footage that, ends up being used without your permission across all kinds of profitable movies and things like that. And you can be the victim of the infringement just as easily as the infringer. You mentioned earlier about how I should trademark my title, the social psychic. Yeah. I wanted to ask if you could explain to the audience how the trademark would go about how you do that versus the copyright and, and you know, what would be, you know, the benefit to that. Yeah. So in order to be eligible for registration and federal trademark, protection here in the United States, uh, the mark has to be distinctive and affixed to the goods or services in, you know, in, in interstate commerce. So the process is, well, I say you should hire a lawyer. This is not as easy as you know, copyright registration is pretty easy. Go to a website, fill out a form and have to be able to, you know, read bureaucrat ease or whatever, but you can do it. Trademark stuff is a little more complex and technical, and there's an actual sort of review and approval process. So you have to describe the goods and services the right way and select the right category or class of goods and complete the application appropriately. It is, there's an online form. It can be done on a do-it-yourself basis. I'll tell you, you know, I charge my clients more when they try to do it themselves first. Hey, I would have to you know, I go fix their application. Um, but you know, bottom line is you, you, you file an application with the government, they analyze it and review it and dis- determine, is it distinctive? Is there any other similar marks that are confusing in the marketplace? And, you know, that would be a problem. And then eventually they issue a uh, notice of publication. It gets published. People get a chance to, to comment and, and object if they don't think it's a, a proper trademark. Eventually, a certificate is issued and you have a registered trademark. And then you've got to keep using it in commerce in order to retain ownership of those rights, which is basically the right to prevent others from using confusingly similar marks. Every five years, well, after five years and then every 10 years, you have to do a, a maintenance filing. Just, yes, I'm still using it and here's proof. So, okay. fair enough. What do you think when you see all the different podcasts that are out there? What do you think is a common mistake that an average podcaster makes when they try to produce a show 
that you look at as from your expertise, you know, in terms of podcasting and, and intellectual property uh, from the stuff we're talking about. But I'd like to say in terms of what you find, if you could do things over to advise people, what would it be in, 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 in the reference to their actual like process of setting up the show or setting up a podcast show? Well, you know, choosing a title for the show is a common mistake as well. What happens is people choose a title that they think sounds really cool. And then they publish a show and then they find out that there's five others or 10. I actually have one client who has a registered trademark for the title of her show and not one week goes by without somebody starting a new show with the same title. What do you do? Well, maybe it's not as distinctive as it ought to be. And she and I have an appointment to talk about this and and maybe rebranding. But what we do is we send a cease and desist. Actually, she has now developed sort of a template of a way she contacts them first saying, Hey, don't know if you're aware. I have a title. I have this show as a title. Here's proof that I have a registered trademark before you go too far. I really think you need to stop. Let's not get the lawyers involved. That's just ridiculous. And nine times out of 10, they, Oh gosh, I didn't know. That's the problem. They don't know. They don't search. They don't inquire before they adopt a title for the show. And you know, if she wanted to, she could sue them all for infringement right off the bat. There's probably not any money damages really, but you give me the scenario on that. Like, let's say, for example, you have a title for a show mm-hmm. and it's a singularity of the, sh- of the title, like the word beach. Let's say we did a fictitious show called My, My Wonderful Beach Life. And then there's an actual established show, My Wonderful Life on the Beaches or My Wonderful Beaches Life. Like, how does that, that work? That would not be trademark infringement, not necessarily be trademark infringing. But if your show title, if you, if the registered show title is beach life and then Monica starts a show called Monica's beach life or my best beach life or, or beach life revisited, or, you know, all those kinds of, those would be potentially infringing because it's the same configuration. And ultimately the test or the, or the inquiry we have in trademark cases is, is there a likelihood of confusion? If somebody were searching for my show, the registered show, and they found all these others, might they land on the wrong one? Might they think that the others also come from me? You know, would they listen to the wrong show? If that's the case, that's damage, that's harm. My sponsors, my advertisers are paying me to get a message to a certain audience. If that audience gets sidetracked or distracted into another direction because of people using confusingly similar titles, they're not gonna wanna pay me as much for the number of people I can reach, right? So. That's how I'm harmed. Yeah. You know, interesting point with that. What if they, what if you're doing, okay. So let's say you started a new podcast next mm-hmm. week and you wanted to find out how to find the right title for your show. And you're doing a search. How do you recommend someone in the audience conduct their own search or due diligence? Should they hire somebody to do it for them? Is there a database to look at or what do you suggest? Well, there are, you, yes, I'd say it makes sense to hire somebody if there's any question at all, but you can do, you know, search engines search for that title, search for the title in the podcast directories, iTunes or Apple podcasts. It's called now the, the Google podcast directory, go on Spotify, go on iHeartRadio. search for these titles, see if it's out there. I also recommend go to Amazon, even though we were talking about books and, and stuff like that. If you search on Amazon and you see somebody's got a series of books by a particular title, or maybe there's a movie or, or an audio book or something like that that's a pretty good indicator that they're likely to enter into the trademark space, into the podcasting space as well. And it just makes sense to avoid that problem. Here's so a, yeah, here's one, I think, of, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, some people well, might have well, one, to- one more place to search oh, before we, okay. the, 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 once the, you sort of cleared all those hurdles, it also makes sense to search the patent U S patent and trademark office, uspto.gov and go to trademarks and search and, uh, You know, you're not, not only searching for the reason I say that one last is that's only going to really find you the exact match word forms for the most part. And you're looking for not just exact, but anything that's confusingly similar. So if you, if you've searched all of those and you feel like it's pretty good to go, I'd say, you know, next step, maybe either register the trademark before you start under what we call an intent to use application or start your show, get a couple episodes in and then do your registration because at that point, you're going to do a comprehensive search using an outside search firm. And they, okay. 
these reports will give you hundreds or thousands of results that you then get to call through. <laughs> so what if this, what if somebody has a, a title that's similar to yours, but they've only done one or two episodes and it's been five years and they haven't done any since five years is the threshold for what oh. we call abandonment. Okay. If it's only been a year, it's entirely possible. They're going to come back. You know, maybe they just got sidetracked or they got sick or, you know, had their kids and they needed to take a break from things. But if they've been, uh, five years is sort of where I would say, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty safe bet that you can go ahead and do this and don't worry about them. Thing is, they're still in the, in the directory. And so there still can be that confusion. That's not going to be good for you starting a new show. If it's going to be confused with that one that was out, there. especially if it, if that new old show has a bunch of bad reviews or just crappy yeah. content. <laughs> So that decision there, yeah. Choose choose something that's distinctive that really sets you apart, and sometimes you just include your name or your you know your business name or something like that in it. But uh, it, this is where being creative and being resourceful really counts. For your vantage point, when you look at the direction of podcasting and where we're headed in the future, where do you think your job as the podcast lawyer is going to be down the road with so many more podcasts occurring? I'm assuming as an attorney myself, that we're going to have increased litigation in the future. Do you, yeah, we haven't, that? we haven't seen much litigation as yet. There've been a few cases, usually high profile personalities or situations involving, you know, big, big shows. I'm not a litigator. I do deals and, and, and business structures and that kind of stuff. And I see myself continuing to do that, helping folks to protect themselves against the litigation, against the problems that come up. And, you know, and I work with a lot of startup small networks that are building up. There's lots of different kinds of networks, but mostly it deals with, you know, advertising collectives and things like that. And, uh, you know, I help them with the contracts. And I think there's going to be more awareness of the need for the contracts, more awareness for the need for the, those prenups that I was talking about, the joint ventures, the co-production deals, the host agreements and those kinds of things. And, you know, I hope that with that increased awareness, people just start to cross more T's and dot more I's. And that's what I'm here to help with. How do you think streaming is, live streaming is going to change podcasting rules? You know, I don't, I don't see a lot of changes happening there. Well, there's one big one in the music arena, but, but other than that, I think the, the rules are fundamentally the same for streaming as they are for, for podcasting. The one big area that I referenced is when you have music streaming, if you don't also have a, a, a download available, you reduce some of the hassles with music. As I said earlier, there's two copyrights for every piece of music, that, for every recorded piece of music. There's the recording copyright and the publishing, the, the composition copyright. There are also a number of different ways those things are used with podcasts. The downloadable version is a license for the download of the recording and a license for the download of the composition. Those are called, well, a master download license and a, a synchronization license. So anyway, so those two, and then also for the recording, same thing. If you only have a stream and there's no, you know, permanent embodiment in a recorded form, then you don't need to worry about the, the right to make a download. All you have is a stream. Music in streaming is paid for through, well, here in the U.S., organizations are ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and uh, another one called GMR, Global Music Rights. These are what we call performing rights organizations, PROs, and they collect royalties from radio stations, television stations, restaurants, bars, anywhere music is performed. These places mostly pay blanket fees to the companies, and then those fees are distributed according to formulas among the various songwriters and publishers and so on. That's how these people get paid. Makes sense. Um, so if you're, if you're doing live streaming, you're looking to make sure that the service you're using to do the streaming on, you know, on the platform is paying those licenses or else you may get blocked or taken down and so on. And I think one thing we will see more of is streaming services being held to the same kind of standards that YouTube and Facebook have been held for their recorded content. If you post something to, to YouTube, a video, and it has music in it, nowadays, YouTube won't even let you post it. They're going to stop it along the way. But you know what used to happen is they would strip the music out or they would make the video non-available. They just, you know, you get a copyright strike. I think as streaming happens more, YouTube, of course, is paying ASCAP and BMI their royalties. I think Facebook is as well, but some of these services may not. Be. In fact, I know TikTok has had some problems. 
I think Twitch has had some problems. You know, there are lots of these streaming services. They're going to have to catch up and do this stuff right, or it's going to be a market nightmare. <laughs> so the market will catch up to the, <laughs> to the ones that, yeah. don't, that don't comply or are in compliance. Well, and the law is always the slow moving component of things. You know, it, it takes a long time f- for litigation to happen, for people to find the lessons in those litigation uh, <laughs> cases and then do something about it. And uh, yeah, right now we're seeing some some interesting stuff in, in uh, the music industry going after cable companies and internet providers that aren't following the rules. And they got a billion dollar judgment against Cox Communications last year. And now they're going after Charter and some of the other when most of the public hears about those cases, you know, we'll hear about it. It'll, come, it'll kind of go like this over our head, mm-hmm. right? Because when you think of a billion dollar judge, we don't, we don't actually comprehend that. But in, in, the, in the industry, I'm sure it makes a significant difference on how things are conducted after enough people get penalized and have to pay civil penalties. Yeah. I mean, you know, these companies are, are the big targets because they're deep pockets. They have a lot of money. But also, you know, Cox Communications has how many million subscribers? paying them money every month for the privilege of using their service to connect and and upload stuff to the internet. Those users uploading copyrighted material, Cox is supposed to stop them from doing that if they know it's happening. And in in that case, they were accused of and and apparently found liable for not really implementing procedures to stop those repeat infringers. And it's like, it's up fast. And if they're failing to police themselves and they need to be policed by the legal system. So I can understand that if they're not doing what they should do and, and, and upholding their end of the deal. Yes, indeed. Well, I looked at your site and I really love the fact that you have easy legal for podcasters. Yeah. I, I wanted to see if you could share that with our audience. So if it's any aspiring podcasters or if there's anyone who's interested in wanting to know more about your easy legal for podcasters product, if you could share with our audience what it's about, how you create it. Yeah. I'm here to help people. I want to, I want to make this stuff easier for people. So first, you know, the, the done for you service, if you, if you need a lawyer and you need the legal stuff handled and you're not a do it yourself type person, hire me and I'll do it for you. That that's, that's the pr- premium service. But I know that in this podcasting space, there are a lot of folks out there who have either the, well, I shouldn't say don't have the budget or the inclination or the desire to work with professionals and have it done for them. They're much more likely to get things done themselves or just wing it. Don't wing it. So I offer a a number of different things. The easy legal for podcasters product is actually a course combined with some templates and forms where I will teach you how to get legit and go pro in podcasting. That is to, to form your business entity, an LLC or a corporation, how to protect your, your brand, your trademark, register those kinds of things. And I walk you through, I show you on screen how to do these things. And I give you access to the necessary forms and checklists and worksheets and, and all that, and a little bit of access to me for question and answer on a regular basis. So you can do that, how to build up your team, make, make these, you know, podcast prenup, the co-host agreements, the deals with your crew and staff and all those kinds of folks, and ultimately how to monetize and make deals with advertisers, sponsors, networks, and those kinds of things. So if you're looking for some handholding and instruction at, you know, a fraction of what it would cost to hire someone like me to do it for you, that's one approach. And if you're really a seat of your pants, do it yourself, or you can also just access the forms and, and templates by going to podcastlawforms.com. So Excellent. how could our audience find you other than what we just talked about? Like if you wanted, if somebody in the audience wanted to contact you, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? Well, the name is Gordon Firemark. That's G-O-R-D-O-N and Firemark, just like it sounds, F-I-R-E-M-A-R-K. Gordonfiremark.com is sort of the central hub for my stuff. And there's links on there to all of these things that I'm talking about. And uh, if you're looking for me, the lawyer, you can reach me at at firemark.com. That's the old law firm website and blog. I appreciate it. What have you found to be the most challenging aspect of your practice? The most challenging aspect of my practice is, I would say, well, marketing has always been a challenge, but it's a, that's kind of a fun challenge. The most stressful part of the practice is when, when a client is unhappy for some reason, that's just no fun for the lawyer. I want everybody to ha- be happy and have a good experience. Sometimes when you're dealing with this legal stuff, it ain't a good experience. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so, you know, that sort of relationship management with clients, I think I'm pretty good at it, but it is sometimes a challenge. And 
it, you know, one other thing I was thinking of just now, you know how you, as a podcaster, you'll pay for a subscription service where the platform will distribute yeah. your show to all these various entities like mm -hmm. you know, Apple or Google. Do, what kind of liability have you seen from the platforms themselves from when people, you know, host their pod like Anchor or any of these kind of things? Yeah. Have you found any legal issues with the platforms? You know, mostly I think these platforms have, first of all, they have very good lawyers, some of whom I consider friends at these companies. Anchors owned by Spotify, you know, Pandora's out there, uh, many of these, these platforms. And, and Spotify and Anchor are an interesting one. I, I'm thinking more of the hosting companies. Anchor is a hosting company. Spotify is a distribution platform. These hosting companies are really fortunate. They are, sub you've heard of probably a lot of talk about Section 230 of, it's of the Communications Decency Act. That law provides a sort of immunity from lawsuits related to material posted by third parties, what we call uh, user-generated content. So if, if I'm running one of these big hosting companies, Libsyn or Blueberry or, or um, Anchor or, you know, name them, Buzzsprout, Podbean, whatever they are, yeah. they have some protection under Section 230 because the it's the user-generated content. They, as long as they you know, have reasonable protections against, you know, protecting against child pornography and, and some of the, the real nasty stuff in the, in the community, the rest of it, they're pretty well protected. They don't have to worry about lawsuits related to the content and especially for, you know, either leaving it up or taking it down. They're, they're immune from all these kinds of suits. So while a lot of folks in the political arena have been rallying against section 230 and how it's just terrible for, these companies like Facebook and Google and YouTube and everybody to be so protected against everything. The other side of it is that's how these businesses are able to operate safely and not charge us an arm and a leg so they can have insurance and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's sort of a part of the way the economy around this stuff operates. So, you know, it, it's not a perfect law, but it, it, it has its, its place. And um, we'll, we'll probably see some tweaking of this, but otherwise they would be liable for, libel and slander and and rights of privacy and all the copyright and trademark infringement cases and things like that that come up against their users they could also be named in all those lawsuits and i think when congress created section 230 they were kind of realizing these companies are never going to be able to flourish if they're always worried about those things you know so, it's interesting point you raised about that when you said earlier that the, the law is sometimes way behind mm -hmm. technology I think I, you may not, whether or not you said that, I, I, I'm you know, saying that when you look at the law written for podcasting, it's actually other laws that are basically not necessarily taken into consideration the digital age we're in right now. Yeah. And, I mean, Congress and the state legislatures didn't get together and say, let's write podcast law today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's and, contracts and copyrights and libel and slander and, you know, those kinds of things. Exactly. Do you think that the advent of podcasting is going to change any of these type of laws? Do you think in the long run, once they're litigated out or once they proceed through the system down the road? You know, so what kind of changes do you think might come? Yeah, the advent of new media have always led to evolutions in the law. Usually it's incremental, sort of slow, as I said, slow moving, <laughs> yeah. uh, because you don't want to leave anything behind and you don't want to make big mistakes. So, you know, you look at when when you know, I mean, you go back in copyright law, sound recordings became possible, what, in the early 1900s. And there, the Copyright Act of 1909, of course, had to address this new medium. Then we had television come in and then we had, well, film came in and then television. And at each step of the way, the law had to adjust and, and uh, the lawmakers would make, some, you know, incremental small adjustments here and there. And then every once in a while, there's a major revision and they go back and they look at everything and, okay, that doesn't apply anymore. And this, so it will change. Podcasting is in a new medium. So is streaming. Who knows? By the time we get a Congress that can actually get their act together and, and accomplish things that aren't, um, you know, at the forefront of national attention, like revising the copyright law, which is overdue. It's been almost 50 years since there was a new copyright law. 1976 was the new law. So when we get that, who knows? I mean, we may have, you know, holograph transmissions as a thing. And so we'll have to address those kinds of things. And fortunately, you know, the way our legal system is set up, we're able to uh, adjust to new technologies by using old law and applying it by analogy to new technology, new things. And, you know, we think this is sort of like that. So we'll apply that other law that applies to that thing. And, but we'll tweak it this way. And the courts are really pretty good at 
making those kind of judgments. I'm looking at your site too. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell us about Firemark TV. <laughs> Firemark.tv is really just my YouTube channel. It's just, I, I got a domain. One of the smarter moves I ever made was rounding up all the Firemark domains early on in, yeah. the, <laughs> in the age of the internet. For, I'm also fortunate to have a sorry, a very distinctive last name. I'm exactly. I was just saying it's, it's, it's very unique. It's like a stage name in a way, but that's your real name. Yeah. Right? Well, and, 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 based on the family tree and how things came, came about, I know that I'm the only adult male fire mark in the world right now. I've got my two sons and that's it. So anyway, I was able to grab firemark.com and .net and .name and, you know, .us and, and <laughs> .tv. And I thought, well, okay, what am, you know, when I started a YouTube channel, I thought, well, okay, I'll, it'll be easier just to tell people go to firemark.tv and it just redirects to YouTube. Okay. Uh, but if you want to see me on on video <laughs> talking about various things. I, and for a long time, I did a Q and a series called asked and entertain law asked and answered. And I would just answer user questions. I'm still willing to do that from time to time, but the questions don't come in as, as fast as they used to. So yeah, every week or so I'll post something on there. Nowadays I do my, my podcast lawyer speaks live, which is a Facebook live session. And then I, I repost that on YouTube as well. And so you can find out a lot about what I'm doing and what I think about things by uh, visiting firemark.tv. I was going to ask you also about the coaching you do or offer to the general public. What kind of coaching is that? Entail? Well, so I have, a, I have another podcast that I've started up just sort of as a passion project around helping creative people in the entertainment business and podcasting and so on, just to accomplish more. The show is called more, better, faster. Okay. And uh, every week I usually, it's just me talking, posting some thoughts and, and, uh, Sometimes it's more stream of consciousness than anything else, but about, you know, how to, how to accomplish more in your life, do it better and get there faster. That sort of led me into coaching people. I, so a couple of people said, Hey, you know, I want to talk to you once on, once a week on in person or on zoom. And you know, what will that cost me just to hear my insights? And, and so I, you know, I steer people, I, I'm, I'm helping them basically get out of their own way. I have to say something since I've been doing my podcast, I've really gained an, a keen appreciation of coaching. Yeah. I feel like coaching can really do a lot to help someone and guide them and give them the skill sets that they can learn and acquire over time. If it's not something you can do yourself, you can ask. Yeah. Them. You know, I'll, I'll say one of the main distinctions between what coaching is and what, and what podcasting podcasting is a, is a talking to people, you know, it's broadcasting or sometimes narrow casting based on the subject matter, but it's me. It's one to many. Coaching is, is one-to-one, -one, and it's more about listening than about speaking. It's more about hearing the subtext, hearing what the person who's speaking may not hear for themselves in what they're saying, and drawing them out, expanding on that, getting them to see their own BS most of the time. <laughs> it's not always BS. Sometimes there's a real basis for it. But, you know, if, if I were sitting and we were talking and you said something that led me to wonder, well, why would he say it that way? I'll ask, why do you say it that way? What do you mean? And, and coaching is really about yeah, drawing people out to, so that they see their own obstacles. They understand their, what beliefs are driving the way they operate and sometimes yeah. you know, tweaking the operating system. Interesting. When you said earlier at the beginning of our interview, you were talking about when you were talking about forms for podcasters and what to do with their team and Mm -hmm. I loved it when you said that you should always anticipate having a good exit provision. Cause I say that to everybody all the time working mm -hmm. as a lawyer and insurance stuff that I do is most of the litigation I deal with is when, you know, you don't have the right, to, any kind of civil litigation, you have contracts that don't have the proper anticipation of an exit strategy. Like if we, if we breach this deal, if we end this deal, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. And, and I think the fact that you mentioned it during our episode today gave me insight too to say to our audience that if you want to do this professionally, make sure you have it all lined up, go to someone like you, consult your site, mm -hmm. get your ducks in a row. And if you're going to DIY, do it yourself, do it yourself right, or hire someone to do it for you. So you could avoid the costly steps involving later on when you're in litigation. And most importantly, if you're going to do it yourself, at least be well informed exactly. in how you're in what you're doing. Don't exactly. just, you know, grab a piece of a form somewhere and, and fill in it, fill it in if you don't understand what you're reading and writing. You do such, a, such an exceptional job making this interesting to my audience today and breaking it down in such a way, because I know a lot of people probably tune out. If it, you, you, you can see your passion when you present it and your knowledge. And I appreciate you coming on today and sharing this stuff with us because 
it's something that I know is so critical and important because of how many people are doing podcasting and creative content right now that they need to keep in mind of things like trademark, copyright, and making sure that they're not infringing on others, um, creative control and content and, and, and title to certain things because it, it could really devastate someone's life if they do it in such a way where they just ignore the rules. Well, yeah. Th- first, thank you for your kind words and, and for having me on. I've really appreciated the opportunity to reach a, a little bit of a different new audience. And that's been yeah. great. You know, one of the things I'll say about podcasting in particular is this is one of those areas where because it's easy to hook up a microphone to a computer and record something and, you know, upload it somewhere and you're done. It feels like it's easy and it's just a you know fun little hobby for people or whatever. But ever even even most other hobbies, there is some stuff, some legal framework, some business framework behind it. I mean, if you're a gun enthusiast for a, an extreme example, there's a whole bunch of laws around that and what you can do and can't do and, and those kinds of things. Maybe you're into flying, you know, the FAA is in there regulating pilots and, and airplanes and things. Every hobby has its business side and I'm here to sort of educate people and share that there is a business side to this podcasting thing and doing it right makes it easier to keep doing it right and successfully. And, you know, my message is get legit and then, you know, go pro in your attitude about it. Even if you never intend to be a professional podcaster, Uh, professionalism is more than just a desire to make money. I love it. I love your experience and your background. And I definitely appreciate you coming on today. And, you know, from my vantage point, I like expanding the reach and scope of my programming mm-hmm. that it just coincides with my show because I'm a podcaster and I yeah. have guests on all the time and I have people who listen to me and out of my audience, I know I have a lot of people who like podcasting and are interested in this idea. Now I have the ability to point people to this episode as like an instructional. If you want to do this, check out my episode with Gordon Firemark. And you can go to his website. And so in other words, it gives me a frame of reference. And that makes me feel like, you know, when you're in law school and you have the outline done before the exam and you're all ready to go because you know what you need to do to study for that exam. And you got the you got the information already and and highlighted and double under. That's how I feel like our episode today. I feel like you gave me the basis upon which to share with my audience and and with others, whoever tunes into this, that if you're going to do this and take it seriously, there's certain rules and regulations you need to think about. And at least if you don't want to do it yourself, then you can contact Gordon directly and he'll be happy to guide you. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Jason. It's been great. I am going to ask you one question. I asked all my podcast guests, if you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be in? Why? You know, I had a question like this on my first job interview as a lawyer. I, I, I thought, I think he was messing with me actually, but he said, if you could be any animal in the, in the, in the animal kingdom, what would it be? And my answer then, and I'm going to use the same answer. I think I'd like to be the giraffe so I can Here see it all from above and get that wide, wide view, but still be able to reach down and, and touch the sure. individual trees and leaves. I love it. I always say owl because I have two parrots and, and I believe that owls reflect the, the desire for wisdom and they're, they look above oh. things. Like you said, same thing like a giraffe. You see above it, you see beyond it, you can mm-hmm. see a picture of it. The yeah, get, the, get the overview and then still be able to be a part of it and on the ground. I just want to thank Gordon for coming on the show today. What an amazing opportunity to have somebody who's so qualified and, and, and really knows this stuff really well to help our audience to understand the framework upon which we're operating within in our current system for podcasting and entertainment law and just having the chance to really think about these concepts, that to me is pivotal. We gotta think of the concepts when you are listening to your favorite show. If it's Joe Rogan or whatever show it is, there's rules and regulations that control these things. And just like if you are on YouTube and you upload a song that you violate one of the copyright terms, you'll, you'll you'll get consequences to that. And I've had certain people in my life that posted photos that were copyrighted and were penalized because they had to pay a penalty to various third parties that they were infringed upon. So firsthand, I will tell you, this stuff's real and it does have consequences. But in terms of the practical application of our episode, I would use this as, like, as I just said earlier in our interview, you can go by and look at this and really think about these concepts. And if there's something more specific that you need to know about, contact Gordon directly. I'm going to have his information in the show notes. And check out the forms that are on his and the courses and the form and and just these different things. I think you have a wealth of knowledge here and it's so powerful. And when we have the ability to be informed and know what we're doing with things, you're going to do that much better. 
So check this stuff out. I'm so happy that we were able to have this conversation today because it's, it, it's, it's important. You need to know, just like you carry insurance when you drive your car, it's good to have the knowledge of the rules and the system in place with reference to us when it comes to podcasting and entertainment and those kind of things, copyright and trademark infringement, all that. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Stay positive because when you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.